having us. What a turnout. He knew I was preaching. He still came. I appreciate that. Um, if you will, take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of First Samuel. This particular book of the Bible has had my attention for weeks now. I started doing a study through First Samuel, and as far as I've gotten is chapter 7, and then I restarted. <laughs> And then I got to chapter 7 and I restarted. And um, once it was because I got a new Bible and I wanted to put all the notes in that new Bible. And the second time I just couldn't get quite, I couldn't get past this thought and I had to go back and look at it again. And so I want to share with you what the Lord's been working on me about. And so um, I apologize if I struggle through it a little bit. But I wanted to share it with you because it's what's on my heart. And um, so... It is what it is. 1 Samuel chapter 3. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, just to give you a little context of where we're, we're picking up, um, we, have, we have read thus far in the, in the book of 1 Samuel about Samuel's family, about his mother specifically coming and praying for a son that she was not able to have. And then she finally um, was able to be blessed with a son, Samuel, and she'd promised that she'd give that son to the Lord. And so... In the previous chapter, she's given that son to the Lord and to serve in the temple. And um, so here we find Samuel. And in, in chapter number three, there's a lot that goes on. Now, part of that is, it's quite an interesting story, and we'll read part of it uh, this evening. But Samuel has essentially been running back and forth to Eli's room all night. <laughs> And he keeps getting woken up, and he keeps hearing his name, Samuel, Samuel. And he runs back to Eli and says, did you call me? And he says, no, I didn't call you. Go to bed. This is what my kids do every night. <laughs> but Samuel is legitimately having somebody call out to him, and he doesn't know what to do. And finally, the fourth time, he knows to say, Lord, I'm here. Here I am. And the Lord speaks to him. And then he has to relay a message to Eli that he doesn't want to relay. The message that... Eli's sons are about to die, that the children of Israel are about to go through some turmoil, and it's a difficult message that he has to relay. But he does it, and he does it faithfully, exactly as God told him to do. And in the very end of this chapter, I just want to point out a verse to you. In verse number 21, it says this, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of God, by the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today, and I thank you for your word, and I pray that you'll help me to preach it faithfully. Help me to be able to get across what it is that you have for this group that's here this evening. And I pray, Lord, that it'll be a blessing, an encouragement, and a challenge to them as well as to myself. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's back up here. We just read verse number 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel in Shiloh. And then there's this key phrase at the very end of that verse. That key phrase is, By the word of the Lord. And so what I'd like to talk to you about this evening, I'm going to put Australia in this blank, but you put your town in this blank. The Lord appeared again in for me, that is Australia. That's where my heart is. That's what I want to see happen. I want to see the Lord appear again in Australia. How does that happen, though? How does the Lord appear again in Hinesville? How does the Lord appear again where it is that you live? How do we actually see God Almighty working in our town, in our life, in our church? How does that happen? All throughout the Bible, all throughout human history, there have been times in which the Lord has appeared and shown Himself real to groups of people. People have been saved. People have had their lives turned around. Great revivals have occurred. You see them all throughout Scripture. And if you're a student of history, you can see them all throughout history. And this happens a lot of the time because someone got very serious about God and devoted themselves to Him, began to pray. But every time it ever takes effect in anybody else's life, it always happens because of one thing. Look with me again at the end of the chapter. There's one specific phrase. By the word of the Lord. You see, 
I can stand up here and I can preach. And I could, which I'm not, but I could be the most eloquent person you've ever heard and make absolutely no impact on the life of anybody. But when God's word is preached, the most uneloquent person ever can have a large impact on people's life. Not because of the person who's speaking, but because the word of God changes people's lives. And we, we say that we want revival with our mouth. And we pray about revival, and we ask God for revival, but so often we're unwilling to see our own life changed by the Word of God. So, the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Did you know what happened? The first several chapters here, the Lord, He takes painstaking effort to make sure that we knew just how bad it was in the temple. He talks about Eli. He talks about his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. He talks about what it is that they're doing. They literally had, for lack of better word, prostitutes at the doorsteps of the temple. And they were involved with them personally. The scripture says that they were sons of Belial. If you look into that, that's what that is. And these men were, were living wickedly. And these are the men that Hannah hands her baby boy over to, if you can imagine that for a minute. In fact, when Hannah went into the temple in chapter 1 to pray, Eli was so used to seeing daughters of Belial in the temple that he mistook her for one. Isn't that interesting? He was so used to that. That's the kind of setting that Samuel steps into. Look with me at the very beginning of chapter 3. At the very beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says this, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Now, we tend to use the word precious, that meaning that something is valuable. But what that word means a lot of the time in the English language is that it's rare. Something typically is valuable because of its rarity. So we say that it's precious. And he says that the word of the Lord was precious in those days. And then it says this, there was no open vision. Or God wasn't speaking to anybody. And you might say, well, why wasn't God speaking to anybody? Perhaps it's because there was nobody that would listen. And we often are critical in the first chapter of Samuel's father. He says some silly things to, to Hannah. But to be fair, when it says that he gave her the largest portion, it's actually talking about the sacrifice. It says that he was divvying out to each of his family members what they would take for the sacrifice, and he gave Hannah the largest portion. Why did he do that? He was partial to her. He wanted to see her prayer answered for a son. Isn't that interesting? Gives you a little bit different perspective on him. But that is one family who's continuing to go to the temple to do what they know that they're supposed to do, even though nobody else is doing it. In fact, in the second chapter, when it talks about Hophni and Phinehas, and they're going through all of the things with the sacrifices and all of that, you know what it says about them? That they were stealing the meat out of the offering. And then it says this, that they made the people's heart to despise the offerings of God. In other words, the people no longer even wanted anything to do with the, the God's things because the people of God were hypocrites. Ouch. How many people have you talked to that said they want nothing to do with church because church people are hypocritical? The truth is, everybody is hypocritical. But we don't help ourselves, do we? And we go to witness to somebody and they've experienced something in church that should have never happened and it, and it burns them long term. Why? Because they're seeing the very people of God do things that the world knows that Christians should not do. If you ever need to know whether or not you should do something, ask a worldly person because they know. And in this chapter, in chapter 3, we see something happen that has not happened in a long time. We see finally... The Word of God has broken through. Somebody is listening at long last. And at the end of the chapter, we find that phrase, 
the Lord revealed himself to Samuel. And so the first thing I want to look at is this. Look with me back one chapter at the very end of chapter 2. It says this. This is the Lord speaking to Eli, telling him about all the bad things that are about to happen, specifically to his family and also the people of Israel. But he also slides this in. In verse number 34, he says, And this shall be a sign to thee that shall come upon thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall, uh, they shall die, both of them. And then he says this, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before uh, mine anointed forever." We often talk about wanting to know the mind of God. God says He's about to raise up somebody that will not only know the mind of God, but will do the mind of God. How do we know what the mind of God is? How do you get to the point where you know what it is that God wants, that you know the mind of God? In this chapter, He says, And I will raise up a faithful priest. That shall do according to that which is in my heart and my mind. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, if you will. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, we find a couple of verses that are quite interesting. You probably, in your own time, I recommend that you read this whole chapter. Because I think it would help give some context. We don't have time to do that tonight. But in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2... Verses number 13, actually we'll start in verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might freely know the things that are freely given to us of God. Keep that in mind. Then it says, Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And then here's this, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And then Paul writes, but we have the mind of Christ. So he spends this whole chapter making a a quick comparison between the mind that the world has, that carnal mind, and the mind that we are to have as that spiritual mind. And then he makes an emphasis and he tells us that we are supposed to have the Holy Spirit, which we do if we're saved people, right? We have the Holy Spirit living within us. And that Holy Spirit, in another place, I won't take you there, but it talks about how the Holy Spirit will teach the things of me, is what Jesus says. So the Holy Spirit's entire job is to remind you of the Scripture. That's what He does. And He confirms the Scripture in your own heart. And so when you're reading the Scripture, how many of you have ever been somewhere where you've read a passage and then later that day that exact same passage comes up in something that you're doing? That's happened for me almost every day, I feel like. And the Holy Spirit is the one bringing those things back to you to give you the wisdom and the discernment of what you ought to do. What is that? That is the mind of Christ being made real in your life. If you want to know what God's thinking about, He wrote it down for you. It's here. The Word of God is the mind of God, and the Holy Spirit's job is to continuously bring the mind of God up before you. And God said, I'm going to raise up somebody who doesn't just know my mind, but is willing to do it. Do you remember that story about the wise man and the foolish man? And the wise man, he built his house on the rock. And the foolish man, he built his house on the sand, right? But Jesus, we we know that story. We think about that story. But what is Jesus actually saying? He's saying, the wise man is the one who hears my word and doeth them. And the foolish man is the one who hears my word and doesn't do it. See, both guys were sitting in church. Both guys were hearing the truth, but only one of them actually did it. You see, it's not enough to know the mind of God, to know the Word of God, but you have to live out the Word of God in your life. And God said, there are people in this temple who know the Word of God but are not doing it. And I'm going to remove those people. 
because I finally found somebody who knows my mind, but is also going to do it. He goes on to say that all of, all of Eli's sons and, and his son's sons and his son's sons for the rest of their lives will beg for a place in the temple just so they'll have a place to eat. That's how serious God was about this. And we want to see God do something in our church. We want to see God do something in Hinesville. I want to see God do something in Australia. But God wants to move. He does. He wants to revive. He wants to do something through us. He's just waiting for somebody who will listen and then do it. Then he can do the work that he wants to do. Samuel's life is an amazing story. I'm, I'm kind of upset with myself that I haven't made it past chapter 7 because there's some great stuff in there. Samuel's life is an amazing story, but none of it happens if Samuel doesn't do what God asks him to. You know, the first king that's appointed over Israel, the reason he is no longer allowed to be king is because he was told what to do and didn't do it. Saul. We are not supposed to be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. So, we've got the Lord's mind is known and obeyed. The Lord's mind is known and obeyed. That's the first point there. Here's the second one. The Lord's word is spoken faithfully. Spoken faithfully. If we want the Lord to appear again here, If I want the Lord to appear again in Australia, His Word has to be spoken faithfully. Look at chapter number 3 in verse 18. Samuel has been visited by the Lord. He's been told all the things that are about to happen to Eli. And then in verse number 15, look at verse number 15 with me. It says, and Samuel lay until morning. Otherwise, he didn't sleep an ounce because he knew what he was going to have to do the next day. And Samuel lay until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things he said unto thee. Ouch. Okay. And then in verse number 18, it says, And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he, that's Eli, said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. Samuel has an extremely difficult message to preach. He doesn't want to say what he's going to have to say. He's going to have to look in the face of the man who's essentially adopted him at this point and tell him that his two sons are going to die, and that a whole bunch of bad stuff's about to happen. And eventually, if you look further in the story, that actually happening also causes the death of Eli. And Samuel has to look him in the face and tell him this extremely difficult thing, but it's what God said, and Samuel was faithful to say it. And because Samuel was faithful to say it, We find in verse number 21 that the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. You see, if Samuel had been a hearer and not a doer, the Bible would not read that the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. If we want something to happen here, if you want to advance as a Christian, if you want to do more for missions, if you want to see God change your life, those of the family around you, you have to be willing to, To speak God's word. That means you have to be willing to witness to others. You have to be willing to teach others what you know about the scripture and discipleship. You have to be willing to talk to people about God's word. What does God want you to tell people? Well, I can tell you one thing he wants you to tell everybody, and that is the gospel. And every one of us have been given that task. Maybe somebody in this building thinks that that, that God is calling them to preach, to not do that would be to let some of God's words fall to the ground. Look with me again in chapter 3. It says this of Samuel in verse 19, And Samuel grew, physically and spiritually, by the way, 
And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And then it says this, and did, not, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. What's that mean? That means every time God spoke to Samuel, Samuel didn't say what Samuel wanted to say. Samuel said what God wanted him to say. And he didn't waste a single word. How many words do we waste throughout the day on stuff that doesn't matter? But this matters. What does God say about it? You know, we talk about the Bible being the only thing that we depend on for our faith and practice. And I think the first part of that's probably true, but the practice part's a lot harder. Because that's what happens in our daily life, right? That's what I actually did today with God's Word. Who did I talk to today about what's in this book? Who did I touch with God's Word today? I'm not talking about dropping two sentences in a Twitter feed, which is what I'm guilty of. But we can't be letting God's Word drop to the ground. He's speaking to you through the services of this church, through your personal devotions, through your time in prayer. Who's hearing what God's saying to you? Who are you giving that to? Surely there's somebody. Surely there's somebody. And if we want to see the Lord appear again and do amazing things, we can't be letting His Word fall to the ground. The Lord's word was spoken faithfully. In that verse, in verse number 35, it talks about, in verse number, chapter number 2, verse 35, it says, And I will raise me up a faithful priest. A faithful priest. Look with me in 1 Corinthians again, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, we find this. In verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But back up a second, because what is he talking about? Who is he calling a steward? In verse number 1, it says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the masteries of God and the mysteries of God. Who are the ministers of Christ? We typically are used to hearing that word minister apply to a preacher or a pastor, right? That is not what that word means. And we've applied it that way, and that's okay. If you want to call somebody minister, that's fine. I've been called that before. But that's actually not what that word means. The word minister simply means to teach God's word. That's all that word means. So if you are a Christian... I could show you passage after passage after passage, which we don't have time for tonight, about how you are supposed to be a minister. We're all supposed to be getting God's word to other people. In fact, when it says that they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ, that word preach was not talking about preaching from a pulpit. It was talking about giving the gospel to people. That's every Christian's responsibility. We are ministers, and therefore, in verse number 2, he says that we are required as stewards to be found faithful to minister his word. Friend, the reason why we aren't seeing the Lord appear like we would like him to appear is because we are not being faithful in stewarding his word. And that's not me preaching to you. That's me preaching to me. We have not been found faithful. We've been hearing, but have we been doing? Because I guarantee you, if one church in this town would do what this says, the Lord would appear again. If we would quit being hearers, and become doers and faithful students and faithful stewards of His Word. Turn just a few pages over with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, I'm almost done, I promise. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. 
reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We typically use this again in an angle towards preachers, and yes, Paul is writing to a preacher. But in verse 1 he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And on that basis, preach the word. One of these days, we are going to stand before Almighty God, and He's going to say, I gave you X amount of truth. Now what did you do with it? When our brother is giving his testimony, he said something that I often say when I'm giving my testimony. I grew up in church. I was in church my whole life. I was in church before I was even aware that I was in church. And I recognize that as a good thing, but I also know that the body of doctrine that I have been taught over those years, I am responsible for. And I am obligated for. And someday, when I stand before God, I will have that body of doctrine. And I will be answering for how much of it I taught to others. Instant. In season. Out of season. What are we doing with God's Word? His Word is what changes people's lives. It's not programs. It's not ministries. It's not... Sunday school classes and, and organizations and mission boards and, 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 and clearing houses and missionaries and preachers. It's what the people of God are doing with His Word. That's what changes lives. You see, your pastor can only meets so many people throughout the week. If the church is to grow, the church people who meet people your pastor will never meet need to start getting God's Word to those people. Because those are the people that God wants to reach through you. There are people that you will meet that I will never meet, that nobody else in this church will ever meet. And you are the only one in this church that will ever meet them. Who's going to give them God's word? Somebody has to be faithful to that. And lastly, in chapter 3. Back to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. In verse 21 it says this, And the Lord appeared again. The Lord's presence appears gloriously. Oh, that God would appear again in Australia. That He would appear again here. He does that through a specific person. It says the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel. God wants to reveal Himself to us. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer thee, you, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 1 John 1, verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, And with His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants to reveal Himself to us. He wants to appear again. And when He does that, He does that through people. And He said that He revealed Himself again. He appeared again in Shiloh. Why? For the Lord revealed Himself to Samuel in Shiloh. And then it says this. By the word of the Lord. So he reveals himself to an individual and he reveals himself by his word. We know John to be the book that speaks quite a bit about the word, right? The gospel of John, that first chapter, is famous for that. But I'm going to turn there in John chapter 1. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read it to you. In the very first verse it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. In other words, it always existed. And then in verse number 14 it says this, And the Word was made flesh, that's Jesus, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you want to know God? God. 
You know him through his word, and his word was robed in flesh. That's Jesus. And friend, if you don't know Jesus, you will never know God. Because he is God. He said of himself, if you want to know the Father, you know me. He looked at his disciples in the face and they asked him, show us the Father. And he said, how have you not seen the Father? You've seen me. You want to know God, you know Jesus. You want to know more about Jesus, you get in his word. Because the word was robed in flesh. He dwelt among us. And the the apostle John here says, and we beheld his glory. Friend, the reason why this world doesn't know Jesus is not because God has not tried to reveal himself. It is because we have not heard and obeyed his word. And I pray that someone in here will decide, today I'm going to be allowed to be used of God so that God can appear again.